In Zechariah chapter 5, verses 5 through 11, we read about a woman in a basket that is carried off to Babylon. Who is this woman? And what is this passage talking about? Is this passage a prophecy about, about an event that is yet future? Or is this passage a prophetic qualification on Israel's historic Babylonian captivity? If you want to understand this passage better, stay tuned. Hi there, I'm Lee Brainerd. Welcome to Soothkeep and another edition of Prophecy in the Crucible. My mission is truth, truth at any cost, truth above every other consideration. Now today we're looking at Zechariah chapter 5 verses 5 through 11. Many prophecy teachers regard this passage as a prophecy about the rise of Babylon in the last days and that Babylon is going to be the Antichrist headquarters. So in, the, in this understanding, they're looking at the wickedness that's, that is in this vessel as the last day's Antichrist iniquity. And they're seeing this wickedness transported. It's being transported from the current seat where the Antichrist iniquity is right now, and it's going to be transported to Babylon, which is the final seat of the Antichrist iniquity. And once it's in Babylon, it's from there that the Antichrist iniquity is going to come to its full head and the Antichrist is going to rule over the world. Now, some, for some, they regard this as literal Babylon, and for others, they regard it as figurative Babylon. Uh, it doesn't really matter which way they go with that. But the question we have to ask is, is this understanding of the passage correct? Well, let's start our examination by actually reading the passage. Starting in verse 5, Then the angel who was talking with me stepped forward and said to me, Lift up your eyes now and see what this is that is going forth. So I asked, What is it? And he said, It is a basket that is going forth. He also said, This is their resemblance throughout the world. In other words, this is what baskets look like everywhere. So don't get too caught up in the basket. We're not that concerned about the basket. What we're concerned about is the woman that's in the basket, and the lead lid that's on the basket. So on to verse 7. And behold, a lead cover was lifted up, and there was a woman sitting inside the basket. Then he said, This is wickedness. And he thrust her back down inside the basket, and he threw the lead cover over its mouth. Here, the wickedness is iniquity, folks. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were two women coming forth with the wind in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the basket between earth and heaven. So I said to the angel who talked with me, Where are they carrying the basket? And he said to me, To build a house for it in the land of Shiner, and to set it there upon its prepared place. Now, in the rendering of verse 11, I followed the lead of the Septuagint because I believe it gives a better rendering of the Hebrew than most of the English translations do. I also want you to notice that when the question was answered, he didn't just give the answer of the location of where the basket was going. He gave the reason of why the basket was going there. Now, the next step in our investigation is to examine the context. We're going to start with the preceding context, which is chapter 1 all the way through chapter 5, verse 4. And in this context, you're going to notice that the main subject all the way through is Israel. Especially Israel in the Babylonian captivity, Israel in her return from the Babylonian captivity, and Israel in her rebuilding efforts on the on the temple, which would be the second temple, and her efforts in rebuilding the city. The main theme, folks, is God's design for Jerusalem after the return from the Babylonian captivity. But in the passage, we also see uh, prophetic foreshortening. We see, for instance, the third temple, uh, which is the tribulation temple. We see the two witnesses. We see the tribulation, and we see the king. We see kingdom blessings. 
Now there's a reason for all the prophetic foreshortening that we see in the book of Zechariah. And th this is simply that there's a clear prophetic parallel between Israel's return from the Babylonian captivity to be involved with the second temple in Israel's gathering in the last days to be involved with the tribulation temple, in Israel's ultimate regathering from all the world after the, the full worldwide dispersion to be involved with the millennial temple. Now this section ends with the tribulation temple and the two witnesses, which we see at the end of chapter 4, and with the flying curse scroll, which we see in chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. This flying curse scroll is going to go out through the entire land, and it's going to cleanse the land of Israel from the ungodly. This can only be the tribulation. Now, next we come to the passage in question, which is chapter 5, verses 5 through 11, the woman in the basket being carried to Shiner. And then we come to the following context, which is chapters 6 through 8. And here again, in these three chapters, the main theme is Israel and Jerusalem, especially her activity that's associated with the return from the Babylonian captivity. We also see again a bunch of prophetic foreshortening, where we see foreshortening between the second temple and the third or the tribulation temple, and we see a foreshortening between Jerusalem at that present time and Jerusalem in the days of the kingdom blessing. Now, in our examination of the context that follows the passage in question, we want to make a particular effort to drill deep in the immediate passage it immediately follows it which is chapter 6 verses 1 through 8 and there's a reason for this because this short passage of scripture sheds a lot of light on the relationship between the woman in the basket in Babylon and the returned remnant from Babylon very there's a very interesting dynamic going on here so let's look at this passage you're going to notice here that we see four chariots these are the four spirits of heaven. These are four angelic servants of the Lord that they come down from heaven to Jerusalem to go forth and to walk throughout all the land and make an investigation. Um, I think this, that when I say that they came down to Jerusalem, I think this is a reasonable conclusion because all the previous context is focused on Jerusalem and we haven't changed our focus or our context. Now notice that two of these horses are going forth to the north country. This doesn't have to be confusing, folks. The north country here is the entire north quadrant. It's not talking about some little tiny dot of land that's immediately directly uh, compassed due north of Israel. It's talking about the whole northern quadrant. It's talking about Assyria and Babylon. Now Assyria at this time was part of the Babylonian Empire uh, that had been conquered by Darius. And the Israelites were scattered throughout this entire northern quadrant of throughout Assyria and throughout Babylon proper. Now, notice that these horses wander to and fro in this entire north region. They're doing a divine investigation. This is angelic boots on the ground, folks. This is God working through second causes and God working through angelic agents. And he does this way more than we think. If, you, if your mind gets attuned to this, you'll start seeing it all over in the Bible. You'll see God working behind the scenes with angels and second causes. For instance, the Lord came down with two angels to visit with Abraham about his... Uh, decision to judge Sodom. We also see a soldier angel in Daniel chapter 10 that's engaged in battle against the prince of Persia. So these kind of uh, angelic activities are always going on behind the scenes. And once in a while, God will pull the curtain back and allow us to see what's going on. Now, notice that the report that these North Country investigators gave the Lord quieted the Lord's spirit. Now, I find this very fascinating. What news did they give him that quieted his spirit? Well, we can answer this question by ans asking another question. What was God's burning heart concern in this whole region? Well, his burning heart concern was the end of the Babylonian captivity and the return of the godly remnant from the Babylonian captivity and that the work was going to go forwards with the godly remnant uh, and the rebuilding of the temple. So the 
If we know what his big burning heart desire in this region was, then we can know that the peace could only come from seeing the return of the godly remnant and seeing progress made on the work with the temple. So what good details were reported that brought the Lord peace? Well, first of all, Babylon had recently fallen to Darius the Mede under Cyrus the Persian, and so now the ba Babylonian captivity could be resolved. Uh, another thing is that Cyrus the Persian in his first year uh, made a decree that the temple was going to be rebuilt. He was going to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem. We see this in Nehemiah chapter 1. We also see that Darius had fully complied with Cyrus's decree, and there was men, money, and gifts flowing to Jerusalem freely from Babylon. We see this in Zechariah chapter 6, verse 10, and we see it in Ezra chapter 1. So the bottom line is, the news basically boiled down to the fact that God's plan was being fulfilled. The godly remnant was returning from captivity, and the temple work was going forward. Now, I want to point out just briefly here in a little rabbit trail that God is grieved and concerned when his work is not going forwards and he is relieved when it is going forwards. To deny this is to deny the plain statements of Scripture in many passages of Scripture and to treat God as if he was just the Spock God of worldly intellectual philosophy, a, a Spock God that has no emotions and no feelings. But Folks, the fact is the Bible reveals to us that God is a God of emotions and feelings. We're created in His image. And there is joy in the presence of the Lord over one sinner that repents. This is not the angels get excited, folks. This is God Himself getting excited. Joy that the angels witness. Now, what does this context that we've just examined say about the woman that's in the basket? Well, the context before, folks, has Israel in Jerusalem in its focus, and it has the focus primarily on the return from the Babylonian captivity and the work in Jerusalem, specifically on the temple. And we see some prophetic foreshortening that goes off into the future with the tribulation temple and the two witnesses. The context, again, that's after is very much focused on Israel and Jerusalem, particularly the return from the Babylonian captivity, and there's a lot of the material is concerning the temple in Jerusalem. We also see some prophetic foreshortening again that's between the second temple and the third temple, and that's between Jerusalem at the present time and Jerusalem in the kingdom. And if we look at the context that's immediately after, so that's chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, we see there's a divine investigation of affairs in the north country, particularly Babylon. And we see a good report that the captivity is returning from Babylon with cash and gifts for the temple. So I want you to notice, folks, the entire context, preceding context and the following context, is taken up with Israel in her captivity, with Israel's return from the captivity, and with rebuilding the temple. So the context suggests, folks, that the woman transported to Shiner must, absolutely must, have something to do with Israel and her captivity in Babylon. The, this is the only reasonable conclusion, folks. This is a reference to Israel being carried away captive to Babylon. But this raises a big question for many people because they're going to say, well, how can this be a, revel a revelation of the Babylonian captivity? That doesn't make any sense. Isn't the captivity already over? Aren't the Jews in the process of returning home? Isn't the temple work already started? I mean, well, yes, to all these questions. But this apparent contradiction causes many to reject this passage as a reference to the Babylonian captivity. They're thinking it can't be a reference to the captivity because the captivity is history. It can't be a prophecy about the captivity because the captivity is history. So they're going to look for a future fulfillment with a future Babylon. And they get really excited because this is a really cool passage about Babylon in the last days. But the problem is, is they have overlooked the true genius of this passage. This is not a reiteration 
of the fact of the captivity. There's no purpose or no need for a reiteration of that fact. Every, every Jew in Babylon, every Jew in Assyria, every Jew everywhere in the world, every Jew in Jerusalem and Israel was fully aware of this fact. Folks, this is not a reiteration of the fact of the captivity. This is a prophetic explanation about the captivity that adds new information to their understanding of the captivity. This contextualizes and clarifies the captivity. The captivity was only over for the godly remnant that was filled with a God-inspired vision to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. The captivity is not over by any stretch of the imagination for the ungodly. Now, the purpose of the captivity was to, to remove the wickedness from the land of Israel, to get it out of Israel. And God is not going to let this wickedness or this iniquity return. So, folks, God has purposed, and this is what he's revealing to them. He's revealing that he has purposed to confine this wickedness in the land of Shiner. He's prepared a permanent home for it in Shiner. That wickedness is going to stay in Shiner. And, folks, Shiner is used here to ensure that nobody thinks this is a reference to the city of Babylon. Now, it's a simple historic fact that there was a strong Jewish community in Babylon for centuries until late in the medieval era, and it continued with relatively strong strength deep into the 1800s. But and it wasn't until the, uh, night, the um, late 1800s and early 1900s that a death spiral started with the Jewish population in Babylon, and this continued until we come to the present day, and there are uh, several reports that claim there are no Jews left in Babylon apart from a tiny handful in Kurdistan. In my mind, there seems to be a, an amazing prophetic correlation here, folks. The death of the planted Jewish testimony in Babylon seems to correlate with the rise of Zionism, the return to Israel, and the plans to rebuild the third temple. And so in my mind, I'm thinking that perhaps this has a similar prophetic significance as the fig tree generation. The generation that sees the end of the Jewish testimony in Babylon is going to see the, the once restrained wickedness return and explode with satanic fury in the last days in Jerusalem. Well, let's examine this subject of a last day's explosion of wickedness in Jerusalem. Now, God restrained the Jewish wickedness in Babylon, according to this uh, passage, and he's also restrained it in other places in other ways. This is similar to his restraint of the mystery of iniquity and the, the, the restraint of what's eventually going to explode in the Antichrist. But at the end of times, this restrained iniquity, this restrained Jewish iniquity is also going to come to a head at a designated time in a designated place in the last days. Now, the process of this evil is, is very significant, and it, and it would uh, behoove us to take a quick examination of it. Israel was, was purged of her classic idolatry in the captivity. She never went back. She's been 2,500 years now without classic idolatry. But folks, this purging didn't change her heart. She's still on the path of unbelief in, the, in God and uh, in unbelief of, of the plain understanding of the promises in the Bible. And uh, so you've got this dispersion of evil, you've got this restraint of evil, but this evil still managed to thrive in Babylon, and it later re-leavened Jerusalem. And, and folks, evil does work like leaven. It doesn't take a whole lot to uh, defile the entire lump and to bring a lot of corruption. Now, this evil... Uh, that was being restrained, it developed a dead ritualistic system. And this eventually evolved into Phariseeism and Sadduceeism. And this evil eventually crucified the Messiah, and as well it persecuted and harried uh, the prophets, and it persecuted and, and uh, gave great troubles to those who would believe in, in Yeshua as the Messiah. 
This same evil now eventually led to what we call Talmudic Judaism. In Babylon, they produced the Babylonian Talmud. And in the land of Israel, they produced what came to be known as the Jerusalem Talmud. And these two different Talmuds are, are very similar. They're on parallel tracks. They only have minor differences. Now, this Talmudic Judaism it, uh, has reinterpreted the prophecies of the Messiah, the prophecies of the kingdom, the promises made to Israel in such a way that the Jewish people are left wide open to receive a mere human being as their Messiah, to receive a mere human being who's campaigning on mere earthly and worldly premises and promises. Now, over the past 150 years, this restraining effort has, that has kept the evil re sequestered in Babylon and kept it sequestered in other places like Europe in America has been relaxed. And now both Jews and this Jewish religious evil are returning to the land of Israel, in particular to, the, to Jerusalem. And folks, now that the lid is off the basket in Babylon and every uh, analogous restraining effort is is has been relinquished the once restrained evil is going to explode in the last days in israel with a vengeance the sad truth is this religious evil is going to lead israel to receive as their messiah the populous man who gives them permission to rebuild their temple and winks at their sin and unbelief folks this is the antichrist and this Man, the Antichrist, is going to betray them and force them to worship him as God in complete and utter rejection of the true God in heaven. This is a fulfillment of Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45. There we see that when the unclean spirit departs from a man, he's going to wander in dry places, he's going to seek rest, and he's not going to find rest. And he's, he decides he's going to return to his home, that he left and he finds it empty, cleaned, uh, and decorated. This is religion without reality. So then he goes and he gets seven other uh, spirits that are even more wicked than he is, and they come back and they take over this house. And then the last state of the man is worse than the first. Folks, this is Israel in the last days. That's what that passage is talking about. You can apply the principle to other things, but that's what Jesus was talking about specifically. Israel's idolatry in the last days when she worships the Antichrist is going to be seven times worse than her idolatry in her past wicked history. Now, this passage is a great illustration of how prophetic error works. It works through a series of missteps. First of all, men are overly excited about evil seated in Babylon in the last days. And next, they see evil planted in Babylon in Zechariah 5. And they assume this must refer to Babylon in the last days. And then they get super excited because this makes a super cool prophecy about last days Babylon. And in their excitement, they fail to notice that this is a restraining of evil, folks, not an unleashing of evil. Notice that the lid gets slammed back down. This is the restraining work of the Holy Spirit, restraining this iniquity so it's not revealed until its proper time in the last days. Um, this can't be evil moved to Babylon in the last days to bloom quickly because this is a restraining effort that lasted for centuries, folks. And finally, because they have already made up their mind, these folks don't examine the context in the history carefully enough to actually test their theory. Their theory gets no real test. In short, they jump to conclusions rather than going through a thorough investigation. And folks, I see this over and over again on many prophetic issues, many, many doctrinal issues. People do superficial research. They don't do thorough research. That is very costly to themselves, to the people around them, and to the work of God. Now, I'm going to give you five insights to avoid making this kind of prophetic mistake. 
One, don't get too excited about any particular prophetic doctrine. If you do, you're going to jump on arguments that are not arguments. You're going to jump on passages that don't apply to the subject and try and apply them to the subject. You're going to twist passages, causing you to lose the light that that passage actually offers. Two, don't cherry pick a verse or a passage out of its context. Three, context is your friend, not your enemy. Four, history is your friend, not your enemy. And five, only embrace the cool interpretation if the mundane interpretation is impossible. And folks, frequently the mundane interpretation comes with cool insights that you're going to miss out on if you embrace the cool interpretation. So in conclusion, I hope that I have helped you understand Zechariah chapter 5 verses 5 through 11 better. The true understanding of this passage sheds light on the iniquity that was sequestered in Babylon for a long time and that will flourish again in Israel in the last days. And Israel's darkest hour, folks, morally and tribulationally, is in front of her on the near horizon. She has a dreadfully dark valley a dreadfully dark valley to pass through. But on the other side of that dark hour, her best days are coming. Her Messiah is going to descend from heaven and deliver her. She's going to receive her promises and her land, and she's going to obtain everlasting joy. Eyes wide open, brain engaged, heart on fire. We'll see you next time.